So Long a Letter by Mariama Ba. So Long a Letter by Mariama Ba. Chapter 1. Dear Aisasu, I have received your letter. By way of reply, I am beginning this diary, my prop and my distress. Our long association has taught me that confiding in others at least pain. Your presence in my life is by no means fortuitous. Our grandmothers in their compounds were separated by a fence and would exchange messages daily. Our mothers used to argue over who would look after our uncles and aunts. As for us, we wore our wrappers and sandals on the same stony road to the Quranic school. We buried our baby teeth in the same holes and begged our fairy godmothers to restore them to us, more splendid than before. If over the years, and passing through the relatives of life, dreams die, I still keep intact my memories, the salt of remembrance. I conjure you up, the past is reborn, along with this procession of emotions. I close my eyes, even tired of feeling, heat and dazzlement, the wood fires, the sharp green mango, bitten into tens, a delicacy of our greedy mouths. I close my eyes, even tired of images, drops of sweat beating your mother's ochre colored face as she emerges from the kitchen. The procession of young wet girls, chattering on their way back from the springs. We walk the same path from adolescence to maturity, where the past begins the present. My friend, my friend, my friend, I call on you three times. Yesterday you were divorced. Today I am a widow. Modo is dead. How am I to tell you? One does not fix appointments with fate. Fate grabs home at once, when it wants. When it moves in the direction of your desires, it brings you plenitude. But more often than not, it unsettles, crosses you. Then one has to endure. I endured a phone call which disrupted my life. A taxi driver quickly hailed, fast, fast. Faster still, my throat is dry. There is a rigid lump in my chest. Fast, faster still. At last, the hospital. The mixed smell of superations and ether. The hospital, distorted faces, a train of tearful people, known and unknown, witnesses to this awful tragedy. A long corridor, Wisdom to stretch out endlessly. At the end, a room. In the room, a bed. On the bed, Modo stretch out, cuts off from the world of the living by a white sheet in which he is completely enveloped. A trembling hand moves forward and slowly uncovers the body. His hairy chest, at rest forever, is visible through his crumpled blue shed with thin strips. This face, set in pain and surprise, is indeed his. The bald forehead, the half-open mouth, are indeed his. I want to grasp his hand, but someone pulls me away. I can hear Maudu, his doctor friend, explaining to me. A heart attack came on suddenly in his office while he was dictating a letter. The secretary had a presence of mind to call me. Mauro recounts how we arrived too late with the ambulance. I think, the doctor, after death, he minds the massaging of the heart that was undertaken, as well as the futile efforts at mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Again, I think, heart massage, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, ridiculous weapons against the divine will. I listen to the words that create around me, a new atmosphere in which I move, a stranger and tormented. Death, the turner's passage between two opposite walls, 
one tumultuous, the other still. Where to lie down, middle aged man's dignity. I hold tightly onto my prayer beads. I tell the beast ardently, remaining standing on legs of jelly. My loins beat as to the rhythm of childbirth. Cross sections of my life spring involuntarily from my memory. Grandiose verses from the Quran, noble words of consolation fight for my attention. Joyous miracle of birth, dark miracle of death between the two. A life, a destiny, says Mauduba. I looked intently at Maudu. He seemed to be taller than usual in his white overall. He seems to me thin. His reddened eyes express 40 years of friendship. I admire his noble hands, hands of an absolute delicacy, supple hands used to tracking down illness. Those hands, moved by friendship and rigorous science, could not save his friend. So Long a Letter by Maria Maba Chapter 2 More the fall is indeed dead, I said to. The uninterrupted procession of men and women who have learnt of it, the wails and tears all around me, confirm his death. This condition of extreme tension sharpens my suffering and continues till the following day, the day of interment. What a seeding crowd of human beings come from all parts of the country where the radio has relayed the news. Women, close relatives, are busy. They must take incense, load the clones, cutting wood to the hospital for the washing of the dead one. The seven meters of white muslin, the only clothing Muslims allowed for the dead, are carefully placed in the basket. The Zamzam, the miracle water from the holy places of Islam, religiously cared by each family, is not forgotten. Rich dark wrappers are chosen to cover Mudo. My back propped up by cushions, legs stretched out, my head covered with a black wrapper. I follow the comings and goings of people. Across from me, a new winnowing fan, bought for the occasion, receives the first arm. The presence of my co-wife beside me irritates me. She has been installed in my house for the funeral, in accordance with tradition. With each passing hour, her cheeks become more deeply hollow, are quite ever more rings, those big and beautiful eyes, which open and close on their secrets, perhaps their regrets. At the age of love and freedom from care, this child is dogged by sadness. While the men, in a long irregular file of official and private cars, public buses, lorries, mopeds, accompany Modo to his last rest. People were for a long time to talk of the crowd which followed the funeral procession. Our sister-in-laws undo our hair, my co-wife and myself are put inside a rough and ready tent made of a wrapper, pulled sound above our heads and set up for the occasion. While our sister-in-laws are constructing it, the woman present, informed of the work in hand, gets up and throws some coins onto the flattering canopy so as to ward off evil spirits. This is the moment dreaded by every Senegalese woman, the moment when she sacrifices her possessions as gifts to her family in-law, and worse still, beyond her possessions, she gives up her personality, her dignity, becoming a teen of service of the man who married her, his grandfather, his grandmother, his father, his mother, his brother, his sister, his uncle, his aunt, his male and female cousins, his friends. Her behavior is conditioned. No sister-in-law will touch the head of any wife who has been stingy, unfaithful, or inhospitable. As for ourselves, we have been deserving, and our sisters-in-law sing a chorus of phrases chanted at the top of their voices. Our patience before all trials, the frequency of our gifts, find their jurisdiction and reward today. 
our sisters-in-law give equal consideration to 30 years and 5 years of married life. With the same ease and the same words, they celebrate 12 maternities and 3. I know with outrage this desire to level out in which modest new mother-in-law rejoices. Having washed their hands in a bowl of water placed at the entrance of the house, the men, back from the cemetery, filed past the family group around us, the widows. They offered their condolences, punctuated with praises of the disease. Modo, friend of the young, as of the old. Modo, the lion-hearted, champion of the oppressed. Modo, at ease as much in a suit as in a captain. Modo, good brother, good husband, good Muslim. May God forgive him. May he regret his earthly stay in his heavenly bliss. May the earth rest lightly on him. They are there, his childhood playmates on the football ground or during bed hands when they use catapults. They are there, his classmates. They are there, his companions in the trade union struggles. The Segal and the Gill come one after the other, pregnant, while skilled hands distribute to the crowd biscuits, sweets, cola nuts, judiciously made the first offerings to heaven for the peaceful repose of a diseased soul. So long a letter by Maria Maba, chapter 3. On the third day, the same comings and going of friends, relatives, the poor, the unknown, the name of the disease, who was popular, has mobilized a buzzing crowd, welcome to my house, that has been stripped of all that could be stolen, all that could be spoiled, mats of all sorts, are spread out everywhere there is space. Metal chairs, hired for the occasion, take on a blue hue in the sun. Comforting words from the Quran fill the air. Divine words, divine instructions, impressive promises of punishment or joy, exhortation to virtues, Warnings against evil, exhortation of humility, of faith, shivers run through me, my tears flow, and my voice joins weakly in the fervent Amen, which inspires the crowd's ardor at the end of each verse. The smell of luck, cooling in the calabashes, pervades the air, exciting. Also passed around are large bowls of red or white rice, cooked here or in neighboring houses. Ice fruit juices, water and card are served in plastic cups. The men's group eat in silence. Perhaps they remember the stiff body tied up and lowered by their hands into a gaping hole quickly covered up again. In the woman's corner, nothing but noise, resonant laughter, loud talks, hand claps, Strindent exclamations, friends who have not seen each other over a long time hug each other noisily, some discuss the latest material on the market, others indicate where they got their woven wrappers from, the latest bits of gossip I exchange, they laugh heartily and roll their eyes and admire the next person's boo-boo, her original way of using henna to blacken hands and feet by drawing geometrical figures on them. From time to time, an exasperated manly voice rings out a warning, recalls the purpose of the gathering, a ceremony for the redemption of a soul. The voice is quickly forgotten, and the bruhaha begins all over again, increasing in volume. In the evening comes the most disconcerting part of the Thursday ceremony. More people, more jostling, in order to hear and see better, Groups are formed according to relationships, according to blood ties, areas, corporations. Each group displays its own contribution to the cost. In former times, this contribution was made in kind. Millet, livestock, rice, flour, oil, sugar, 
mug. Today, it is made conspicuously in banknotes, and no one wants to give less than the other. A disturbing display of inner feeling that cannot be evaluated, now measured in francs. And again, I think how many of the dead will have survived if before organizing such festive funeral ceremonies, the relative or friend had bought a life-saving prescription or paid for hospitalization. The takings are carefully recorded. It is a debt to be repaid in similar circumstances. Mother's relatives open an excise book. Lady mother-in-law, Modos, and her daughter have a notebook. Fatimi, my younger sister, carefully records my takings in a notepad. As I come from a large family in this town, with acquaintances at all levels of society, as I am a school teacher, on friendly terms with the people's parents, and as I have been Modo's companion for 30 years, I received the greater share of money and many envelopes. The regard shown me raises me in the eyes of the others, and it is Lady Mother-in-law's turn to be annoyed. Newly admitted into the city's bourgeoisie by her daughter's marriage, she too reaps banknotes. As for her silent, haggard child, she remains a stranger in these circles. The sudden calls from her sister-in-laws bring her out of her stupor. They reappear after their deliberation. They have contributed a lifetime of 200,000 francs to dressers. Yesterday, they offered us some excellent yakri to quench our thirst. The four families griots as proud of her role as go-between, a role handed from mother to daughter. 100,000 francs from the father's side. 100,000 francs from the mother's side. She counts the notes, blue and pink, one by one, shows them round and concludes. I have much to say about you falls, grandchildren of Damel Madiodio, who have inherited royal blood. But one of you is no more. Today is not a happy day. I weep with you for Modo, whom I used to call Bag of Rice, for he will frequently give me a sack of rice. Therefore, accept this money, you worthy widows of a worthy man. The share of each widow must be doubled, as must the gift of Modo's grandchildren, represented by the offsprings of all his male and female cousins. Thus, our family in law take away with them a word of notes, painstakingly topped, and leave us utterly destitute. We will need material support. Afterwards comes a procession of old relatives, old acquaintances, griots, goldsmiths, liobes with their honored language, the goodbyes following one after the other at an infernal rate are irritating because they are neither simple nor free. They require, depending on the person leaving, sometimes a coin, sometimes a banknote. Gradually, the house empties. The smell of steel sweat and food blend as trails in the air, unpleasant and nauseating. Colour nuts spat out here and there have left red stains. My towels, kept with such painstaking care, are blackened. Oil stains on the walls. Balls of crumpled paper. What a balance sheet for a day. My horizon lightened. I see an old woman. Who is she? Where is she from? Bent over. The ends of her booboo tied behind her. She empties into a plastic bag the leftovers of red rice. Her smiling face tells of the pleasant day she has just had. She wants to take back proof of this to her family, living perhaps in Wakam, Tiaroi, or Pekini, standing upright, her eyes meeting my disapproving look. She mutters between teeth, reddened by colonnades. Lady, death is just as beautiful as life has been. Alas, it's the same story on the 8th and 40th day, when those who have learned belatedly make up for lost time. Light attire, showing off slim waistlines, prominent backsides, 
the new braziers or the ones bought at the second-hand market, chewing sticks, weathered between teeth, white or flower shawls, heavy smell of incense and of gongo, loud voices, stringent laughter, and yet we are told in the Quran that on the third day the dead body swells and fills its tomb. We are told that on the eve it bursts. And we are also told that on the 40th day it is stripped. What then is the significance of these joyous institutionalized festivities that accompany our prayers for God's mercy? Who has come out of self-interest? Who has come to quench his own test? Who has come for the sake of mercy? Who has come so that he may remember? Tonight, Benito, my co-wife, will return to a sicker villa at last. Phew. The verses of condolence continue. The sick, those who have journeyed or have merely arrived late, as well as the lazy, come to fulfill what they consider to be a sacred duty. Child naming ceremonies may be missed, but never a funeral. Coins and notes continue to pour on the beckoning fan. Alone, I live in monotony, broken only by purifying baths, the changing of my morning clothing every Monday and Friday. I hope to carry out my duty fully. My heart concurs with the demands of religion, read since childhood on their strict precepts. I expect not to fail. The walls that limit my horizon for four months and ten days do not bother me. I have enough memories in me to ruminate upon, and these are what I am afraid of, for the smack of bitterness. May their evocation not soil the state of purity in which I must live. Till tomorrow. So long a letter by Mariamaba, Chapter 4 I said to my friend, Perhaps I am boring you by relating what you already know. I have never observed so much because I have never been so concerned. The family meeting held this morning in my sitting room is at last over. You can easily guess those who were present. Lady Mother-in-law, her brother, her daughter Benito, who was even thinner, Old Tamsir, Modo's brother, and the imam from the monks in his area, Mauduba, my daughter, and her husband Abdu. The miracle commanded by the Quran requires that a dead person be stripped of his most intimate secrets, thus, is exposed to others what was carefully concealed. This exposure crudely explains a man's life. With consternation, I measure the extent of Modo's betrayal, his abandonment of his first family, myself and my children, was the outcome of the choice of a new life. He rejected us, he mapped out his future, without taking our existence into account. His promotion to the rank of technical advisor in the Ministry of Public Works, in exchange for which, according to the spiteful, he checked the trade union revolt, could not control the mire of expenses by which he was engulfed. Dead without a penny saved, acknowledgement of debts, a pile of them, cloth and gold traders, home delivery grocers and butchers, car purchase installments, hold on, the star attraction of this stripping, the origins of the elegant sticker villa, four bedrooms, two bathrooms, pink and blue, large sitting room, a large room flat, built at its own expense, at the bottom of the second courtyard for Lady Mother-in-law, a furniture from France for his new wife, and furniture constructed by local carpenters for Lady Mother-in-law. This house and its chief content were acquired by a bank loan, granted on mortgage on Villa Fallen, where I live. Although the title deeds of this house bear its name, it is nonetheless our common property, acquired by our joint saving, insult upon injury. Moreover, he continued a monthly payment of 75,000 francs to the sick-up. These payments were to go on for about 10 years before the house would become his. 4 million francs, borrowed with ease, 
Because of his privileged position, which had enabled him to pay for Lady Mother-in-law and her husband to visit Mecca to acquire the titles of Alaja and Alaji, which equally enabled Benito to exchange the Alpha Romeos at the slightest dent. Now, I understand the terrible significance of Modu's abandonment of our joint bank account. He wanted to be financially independent so as to have enough elbow room. And then, having withdrawn Benito from school, he paid her a monthly allowance of 50,000 francs, just like a salary, due to her. The young girl, who was very gifted, wanted to continue her studies to sit for her baccalaureate. So as to establish his rule, Mordo wickedly determined to remove her from the critical and unsparing world of the young. He therefore gave in to all the conditions of the grasping lady mother-in-law and even signed a paper committing himself to paying the said amount. Lady mother-in-law brandished the paper for she firmly believed that the payments will continue even after Mordo's death out of the estate. As for my daughter Daba, she waved about a bailiff affidavit dated the very day of her father's death that listed all the contents of the Sika villa. The list supplied by Lady Mother-in-law and Benito made no mention of certain objects and items of furniture which had mysteriously disappeared or had been fraudulently removed. You know that I am excessively sentimental. I was not at all pleased by this display on either side. So Long a Letter by Maria Maba Chapter 5 When I stopped yesterday, I probably left you astonished by my disclosures. Was it madness, weakness, irresistible love? What inner confusion led Modafol to marry Benito? To overcome my bitterness, I think of human destiny. Each life has a share of heroism, an obscure heroism, born of abdication, of renunciation and acceptance under the merciless whip of fate. I think of all the blind people the world over, moving in darkness. I think of all the paralyzed the world over, dragging themselves about. I think of all the lepers the world over, wasted by their disease. Victims of a sad fate, which you did not choose, compared with your lamentations, what is my quarrel? Cruelly motivated with a dead man who no longer had any hold over my destiny. Combining your despair, you could have been avengers and made them tremble. All those who are drunk on their wealth tremble, those upon whom fate has bestowed favors. A heart powerful in its repugnance and revolt, you could have snatched the bread that your hunger craves. Your stoicism has made you not violent or subversive, but true heroes, unknown to the mainstream of history, never upsetting established order, despite your miserable condition. I repeat, beside your visible deformities, what are moral infirmities from which in any case you are not immune? Thinking of you, I thank God for my eyes, which daily embrace heaven and earth. If today, moral fatigue makes my limbs stiff, tomorrow, it will leave my body. Then, relieved, my legs will carry me slowly and I shall again have around me the iodine and the blue of the sea. The star and the white cloud will be mine. The breath of the wind will again refresh my face. I will stretch out, turn around, I will vibrate. Oh, health, leave in me. Oh, health. My efforts cannot for long take my mind off my disappointment. I think of the suckling baby, no sooner born than orphaned. I think of the blind, who will never see his child smile. I think of the cross, the one armed man has to bear. I think, but my despair persists. But my rancor remains, by the waves of an immense sadness breaking me. Madness or weakness, heartlessness or irresistible love, 
What in a torment led mother fall to marry Benito? And to think that I loved this man passionately, to think that I gave him 30 years of my life, to think that 12 times over I carried his child. The addition of a rival to my life was not enough for him. In loving someone else, he burned his past, both morally and materially. He dared to commit such an act of his avowal. And yet, what didn't he do to make me his wife?